we have something we call eco managers, which are people the clients can hire, not just that we build the websites, but run their websites. Give suggestions on how these things should be handled. We have eco managers talking to clients and see if a client has an idea, maybe there is a better way of serving the customers the products you actually want them to buy during Black Friday. Hey, Bob WP here, and welcome to Woo Dev Chat, a Do the Woo podcast show. This episode is brought to you by Jetpack Manage, the newest product for developers where you can keep up to 1,000 sites secure and running for clients while keeping them happy. And take the effort out of determining tax rates for your clients or yourself with automated tax management from Avalara Avatax, now covering more VAT scenarios when you sell into or across the EU and UK tell you more about our sponsors later in the show. But today, Zach and Carl are joined by Ninad from Maximer, a WooCommerce agency based here in Europe. Of course, the topic of optimizing database performance often is in these conversations. And this time they chat about monitoring server resources and preps for high traffic events. But hey, that's not all as you can guess with this conversation. So let's tune in. Welcome to another Do The Woo Dev Chat. I'm Zach Stepik. I'm here with Carl Alexander, as always, uh, and Carl Board behind him as uh, frequent. Yes, frequent stalker, making sure I don't, you know, he makes sure, him and Bob make sure that I don't talk too much, basically, (laughs) you know, they need to cut me off. Yeah, we have Bob sitting backstage as normal, just waiting to make sure that uh, Carl doesn't ramble too long. Um, and yeah, it, it does happen occasionally. Uh, so Carl, how has, uh, your January been so far? How's 2024? It's good. I just did my year in review. So it's like, it was like 10,000 words because you know me, I can't do anything half ass. So, um, that was a lot of it. Then I worked during the holiday. I don't know. I didn't really have much of a holiday. I was like, I'm going to take four weeks off and then didn't happen like i might have gotten to basically <laughs> you know i was like i have all these video games i want to play and then i didn't even fin. i was like playing hogwarts and then i didn't even finish hogwarts yet so you know we'll get there i took a couple of days i started final fantasy 16 uh have not finished so yeah it's been a good time and then of course you know the steam deck remains a uh a constant Anytime I'm stuck somewhere where I don't have uh, the ability to work, the Steam Deck's a great replacement for uh, having my computer in front of me. So, um, well, that's awesome. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a busy month so far. Uh, and, you know, the the day job is uh, is getting busier every <laughs> every month, which is great. Other than that, not a lot going on on my end. Uh, just trying to start the year out with a focus on avoiding burnout. So really just trying to, uh, trying to push in, in the, in that direction, make sure I, I do everything I can to avoid the potential of burnout by being intentional about breaks and intentional about, uh, time to relax. So, yeah, I talked a lot about burnout during the, the review too. So that's a constant struggle for me too. So, okay. Well, we're here to talk about uh, dev and obviously burnout's part of that. And so is avoiding burnout. So we've been there. We've, we've done that. Uh, But we have a guest this, this month and Carl, I'm going to let you do the introduction this month. And so we have Nenad with, uh, with us and I met Nenad last year at WordCamp Asia and honestly, we just kind of bonded with him and his boss, Nils. They, they work at Maximer, uh, which is like a WooCommerce agency in Europe. And they're just really passionate about bringing WooCommerce to like the next level. Like out of everybody I've met, they're like the most passionate about like solving all the scaling problems, like 
Do you have a million SKUs? Okay, let's talk talk about it. You know, do you handle like thousands of orders? We want to talk about it. Um, like, how do we find the ways that, you know, the, I like to say like the gears start flying out of the machine, you know, like in the cartoons of the WooCommerce machine, like how do we find those things and how do we level it up? So honestly, Nenad's on the technical side, Nils more on the business side, but the two of them together are really uh, pushing to get WooCommerce to that next level that we really, we all want it to get there. So hopefully that was a good intro. What do you say, Nenad? That was an excellent intro. And yes, uh, hi everyone. And thanks, Art, for introducing me. Uh, yeah, as you said, we met in Asia uh, last year um, on WordCamp Asia. And yes, as you said, we kind of clicked from the first two sentences because we were uh, we met on a boat, right? Yeah, we, we were on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately we started talking about um, what what does Woo at the Woo kind of scaling of WooCommerce mean uh, and kind of how how are we approaching it? And it was a very, very interesting talk. Yeah, I talked about it actually in the year in review because Bob gave me the like Bob, who's in the back, he's the he's the one that gave me the invite to that to that boat, and it was like <laughs> it was like the best meeting I had all year. So it was like, so thank you, Bob. Nice. It was really fun because we also rarely uh, meet people that have kind of these kind of struggles, especially in the WooCommerce space. Uh, WordPress space, I I would say, uh, is a bit different, and it has more agencies that work with scale. WooCommerce, as far as we uh, managed to figure out, doesn't have that much uh, focus on big, big, big merchants with a lot of SKUs and a lot of uh, purchases per minute. Um, so yeah, that was a very interesting talk. Yeah, yeah they can imagine. Um, when I started my agency in 2017, I think we were one of the one of the first that was really focused on uh, performance at scale with WooCommerce. So it's, uh, it's been cool to watch other people joining that space and really, you know, starting to pursue those same, uh, challenges and things that, uh, that we were pursuing. Uh, and I see here on your, on your website that one of the things that you put forward right away is, uh, integrating with ERP systems. Um, yeah. So kind of the short history of the company is, uh, yeah, it, as the name says, Maximer means maximize in English, was kind of tending to help the customers uh, reach broader audiences and increase sales. Uh, but early on, we realized that there is a need for uh, people not having to uh, manage their stores in multiple places. Like if you have a merchant who is uh, maybe in business to business merchant, uh, they need to, to handle their in stock. Uh, with their own uh, ERP system or CRM system. And then they, uh, if they want a store that will be uh, serving the customers with their products, uh, you need a separate WooCommerce installation or an e-commerce installation uh, that will do that. And people were uh, bothered by having to work at two places at the same time, uh, managing uh, both stock and purchases in both systems. So there was a need to create some kind of a tool that will ease their pain and this is how we created uh, an internal platform called Mako or Maximer Connector that uh, integrates with a lot of uh, ERP systems that are mainly used in Scandinavia because that's our primary market. Yeah, we see a lot of that on our end too, you know, like uh, the Sages and uh, and and that stuff, you know, the the large ERP systems. Or we see Microsoft Dynamics, yes, uh, quite frequently. So it's kind of crazy that you know there's this world of integrations and things that larger e-commerce stores generally are using that the WooCommerce market has barely t- you know tapped the surface of at this point. You know, and ERP is just the beginning of that, right? If you're if you're dealing with a large retailer that has a whole bunch of stores. They don't just want ERP, they want point of sale integration. And they want point of sale integration so that when they update a price in their store, it updates on the website automatically, right? Yeah, exactly. And so it's really cool to see another company, another agency that's looking at that kind of uh, of level of integration 
Uh, Because deep integration is what makes WooCommerce really stand out. This is hard to do with other platforms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, So, yeah, as I said, we we created a tool that is more kind of a a configuration tool that you all we already have connectors to a lot of uh, from WooCommerce or Shopify or a couple of more systems directly to these ERP systems. And all you need to do is basically give us an example of your data and uh, we will translate it to WooCommerce API and make the connection happen. Uh, so we, yeah, we realized that uh, kind of focusing ourselves and uh, making ourselves uh, experienced in this area uh, will bring us kind of further. And it did. Uh, it got us a lot of uh, clients that because of they were looking for this um, connection part of the of the whole project, uh, they came to us and we built not only that uh, integrator, but also the whole shop for them as well. Yeah, it's really easy when you can supply the hardest part of the project to go ahead and say, yeah, why don't we just do the, the other stuff too? It's That's an easier sell at that point. Yeah. So you, you have a, a middleware product, basically, that, that does the translation. Yes. And just out of curiosity, what technology stack did you guys decide to build that in? Well, it was built a while back, and originally it was b- built in Zen Framework. Ooh, that's like, that's old school. Yes, and I remember when I joined Maximer, uh, we were still doing configurations kind of in, in terminal, uh, kind of editing the configurations file manually and kind of adding stuff uh, to the kind of translator, translator files. Uh, but from there, we moved to Laravel and built a UI that can serve um, yeah, us better and the clients better. And we are also making a tool or, or a platform that you can actually register on and just let customers do uh, the connection part or defining the data uh, for the connector. So it will serve more kind of a standalone tool that will speed things up as well. Yeah, and it's self serves so like you're not, you don't have to be like as involved in the whole process. Yes. Yeah. Do you find that they 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 burn themselves with it though? Well, uh, yes, they they often need help. Uh, they often need <laughs> help, but again, if they can do ten or fifteen percent of the work, uh, we are happy and they're happy as well. Yeah, that's good. And after they can, they don't have to contact you to to make every small change too as well. Uh, True, and we are using also not only uh, MySQL, but also MongoDB and Redis and all sorts of uh, helper tools that speed data transfer up. Do you like Mongo? I I don't know if we should even go that tangent. (laughs) That's like the last hype. That was my last hype. I mean, okay, I don't know if you will consider the fact that I love serverless that much as a hype train, but... But that was the last real hype train that I feel like I got on was like, I didn't get on the microservices hype train. I didn't get on all that other stuff, but I got on the Mongo hype train really hard in the late 2010s. Well, yeah, I, I, I like Mongo a lot. It serves a different purpose to MySQL, I would say, um, because you, you want to kind of store collection of data right? Uh, similar to what J- an API will give you or JSON. So in, in a particular sense, yes, it's much better than using MySQL for, for some things, but I would go uh, as far to say that everywhere you should replace yeah. uh, relational data with, you know. No, no. And it was, I remember like the main thing that was like, okay, but if your data, your data format changes, like what happens? And it was like, Oh well, you know, and it's like, and they, they didn't really have an answer. To that. <laughs> it was just like you're gonna have to deal with it yourself. It was like, oh, okay, and that was like, that's kind of when I was like, okay, well, maybe just storing JSON blobs in Postgres or MySQL now. Like back then, it was like Postgres had it. I mean, honestly, between you three, I was like. With the U2, like I would, if I could, I would just use Postgres everywhere. If I could, like, <laughs> I like, I feel like Postgres is the best database. Like, basically, like, you can get data types for everything you could ever need. Like, you can, like, it's just so versatile. But yeah, yeah, you could write functions on the SQL level, right? Yeah, exactly. Also, like, it's just, 
it's so strong. Like it's a, it's a secret part of me wishes like WordPress supported it, but yeah, it's like. But yeah, I still end up using MySQL. Even Laravel is like always MySQL. Like, like everybody want, uses MySQL, but I wish I, I, I was like, okay, like I'm doing Postgres now. <laughs> We're actually experiment, experimenting with it because it offers some of the uh, clustering tools uh, that MySQL doesn't have. So Yeah, exactly. It does so much. Like years ago when I was in agency still, we did a calendar like, you know, like now there's event calendar and stuff like that. But uh, like, it's a complicated plugin. Like I like read papers, like I read, pe- like I read like papers on how to do like proper like calendaring. And like, I remember at some point figuring out that Postgres just had a data type for scheduling that I could have just like used and it would have saved me like, like so much work basically. Like so much of the complexity was like making sure like you were scheduling things properly. And it was like, Oh, like this is just built in into the database. I'm like, you can't see me because there's no <laughs> video, but like my head like exploded basically everywhere. And I was just like, why am I wasting so much time writing all this code <laughs> and finding all these bugs and it's solved for you? What do you, what do you, you, you're just using it for the clustering or you have other data types and stuff that you're kind of interested in? No, because we haven't got the, we, we didn't find a proper uh, solution that it will, that would solve something in WordPress. Uh, but we were, we were trying to use PostgreSQL because there are easier tools to create database clusters on than just MySQL. Yeah, definitely. Without a doubt. I'm a fan of uh, both the, the Postgres uh, clustering, but also MariaDB's Galera clusters. Instead, yeah, on all of our installations, we are using MariaDB, and we are mainly uh, experimenting with uh, Galera clusters. Yes, yeah, Galera is great. Um, just it's so easy to run a virtually synchronous master master environment that way. You know, it's it's a multi master cluster. Do you want to explain it a bit more for people that that don't necessarily know what it is, <laughs> which is probably most people. <laughs> 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 so virtually synchronous means near synchronous, right? It's it's as close to at the same time as possible. But what Galera does is when, when a write is happening, it will lock everything across the cluster to make sure that the write is replicated before any reads can happen. You can set it up, right? You can you can, you can tweak it a bit. Yeah, and why do we need that? Well, the the biggest problem with database replication, especially in WooCommerce, for example, is that when you're placing an order and the order is getting written to the database and then it switches to the order confirmation page and at that point the load balancer decides, "You know what? You should be on a different webhead." And that webhead's connected to a different database server. And that replication hasn't happened yet. The order confirmation page breaks. That's the most common thing that you... That's like, that's a really good example, actually. That's... It's the most common thing you see as, as a replication lag issue inside WooCommerce is to have the order confirmation page break during checkout. How bad's the locking when you do that, though? Like... Because uh, rem- remember, like when you had like problems with like data, like row lock, like it, does it just do a row lock or does it do a full database lock when it's writing? It it depends on your configuration, but basically, it makes sure that that record can't be read by default until all of the servers have it. So you know, it'll get it'll just queue the request until it's replicated. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So it doesn't like lock the entire database, like so that you you know what I'm talking about, right? Like like if you don't configure locks properly, like with writes, you can like that was like the MySM problem, right? Like because it had table locks, yeah. and it was like you write you write one thing to the table, and it's like now I was just thinking, oh my god, it's like MySM on like steroids now. Like not only are you locking your table, you're locking all your data, your servers at the same time. Yeah, so, and then there's this group commit thing that you can do where uh, groups of transactions get flushed to disk together uh, to to improve performance and really just speeds up uh, everything across the board with, you know, readability, with uh, everything you're doing with the Galera cluster. Um, 
so synchronous replication, it's, hi it's highly available. If one of the nodes crashes, you don't lose any data, which is a huge thing. And all the cluster nodes remain consistent. So transactions then are executed on all the nodes in parallel, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and in kind of a usual cluster setup, you would have one main uh, node that will serve kind of as master or main node. And then the other one ones will be the ones that you just read from, right? Uh, but in Galera cluster, you can actually um, configure it so you have multiple master nodes. So you can it can decide on which node to write to, and then the other ones would get the information sync. Yep. So it doesn't have a single node that it writes to as well, which is uh, nice for if, if the main node fails, then you are done. But in this, in Galera clusters uh, example, uh, you would have another node that can also receive writes not just reads, which is kind of cool. That's cool. Yeah, so all of this replication, you know, replication lag is the problem that we run into normally, right? By having the synchronous replication as an option, you know, the uh, virtually synchronous, as they call it, by being able to do that, we eliminate le the replication lag component, which for a long time was the reason why we at my former agency would not deploy a replicated database because replication lag was a huge issue. If you can't deploy a cluster, what's your only other choice? The only other choice is deploy a larger database server. And you go larger and larger with bare metal as far as you can until finally you reach the limits of the capability of computing. When you get there, you know, without the ability to deploy a second server and have replication, there's nowhere else to go, right? You know, we, we had to have a solution to this, and uh, Galera replication really helps with that and, and makes it easy to do with MariaDB. And I think the, you know, Postgres uh, replication is great as well. It does, it does a great job. It's just, I don't think it's as easy to configure. In, in my opinion, as Galera is. Yeah, that is also what we found. But again, the interesting fact about Galera clusters is also we are experimenting, as I said, with pushing kind of the limits of uh, WordPress and WooCommerce. And WooCommerce is a platform that does a lot of rights. What's basically whatever you do. Uh, either you are putting stuff to cart, say it's, since it's kind of a, sessionless uh, platform and everything is stored in a database, there are a lot of frequent writes uh, to the database, whatever you, I mean, kind of depending on the action you're doing, but it's, yeah. So uh, what we also figured out, if we want to make uh, kind of an internal um, guide on how are we uh, scaling the database part. So are we going to actually use a cluster? When it does it make sense to use a cluster more than actually putting uh, a database on a bigger server with more resources and optimizing those? So I wouldn't say that, that the Galera cluster will solve all the scaling problems uh, because, for example, we made a site that we, we put, I think, about 800,000 different SKUs, SKUs um, yeah, I think we have about 400,000 uh, products and a lot of them are variable products. So at about 800,000 SKUs, we have about 100,000 users uh, on the site. And we start with about 100,000 um, already made purchases. And then we actually uh, do a stress test on this site uh, and try to figure out uh, what is going on behind the scenes and where are the biggest clogs and uh, why is the database struggling? Um, and again, uh, you can scale the web part or the PHP part of it pretty easily. But when it comes to the database, uh, that that is something you need to pay attention on how to configure so it doesn't eat up your resources, server resources. Do you have clients who sell into or across the EU and UK? Likely you may not know about cross-border or international selling or maybe you need to learn a little bit more because a little knowledge goes a long ways. And with Avalara's Woo integration via Avalara's Avatox, you can help your clients focus on selling 
while not having to worry about determining tax rates, even with various product types. They use automation to make VAT and sales tax calculation faster, easier, and more accurate with their built-in VAT calculation. Just go to the Woo Marketplace over on WooCommerce.com and search for Avalara's Avatax. Have you seen the newest product for agencies called Jetpack Manage? It's pretty cool with the power to take care of up to 1,000 sites where you can monitor client site security and performance, plus manage all your client sites in one place. It's great as you will get notified immediately if a Woo store needs attention. So you can get right on it with little downtime and keeping your clients happy. So simply go to jetpack.com forward slash manage to learn more. When you're doing work like this and you're trying to optimize these complex WooCommerce stores, what does your tool set look like for figuring out what's going on on the server? What what APM is your favorite? What well, uh, what we uh, started with uh, a long time ago is a tool called Fly, Flood IO. I think Carl, you are familiar with that one. Yeah, I love Flood IO. <laughs> it's the best. Yeah, and they allow you also to add your own kind of. Uh, end-to-end scripts that you can spin up uh, actually a browser and uh, write commands that uh, kind of emulate the user as close as you can. Uh, They also uh, went far uh, to kind of create their own um, language for writing uh, tests and you can actually spin up a lot of like you can spend 500 instances running your test that goes through the site and does whatever you want it to do. So you can create pretty nice uh, stress tests with this tool, I would say. And then what we also do, uh, we monitor uh, the server itself, kind of the resources, uh, the SQL queries, which regular Linux scripts. Um, uh, but also we use a nice tool called Blackfire. I don't know if you're familiar familiar with that one, uh, which gives you a very good visualization of the uh, profiling of the actual site. So it gives you a visual representation of how resources are used, uh, how much time the page took to load, uh, how much uh, memory it took to load the whole page, how much CPU time it used, and also list all SQL queries that were run in this. So what we also do is during the stress test, uh, we run Blackfire and see how page loads behave where the site is not under load and how page behaves uh, when the site is under high load. And then we can uh, decide on, do we need to optimize? Do we need to change a certain part of the application so it runs smoothly, although you're on uh, high load and stuff like that? That's really cool. Um, one of the things that I like about using New Relic or uh, Datadog or any of those tools is that a lot of them understand the platform that you're using. So, like, for example, um, I know Blackfire has a, a great Laravel testing suite built in. And, you know, understanding what's going on in WordPress, in your framework, that that matters, right? Being able to know what hooks and filters are and and knowing you know, what those things do uh, and being able to track when those calls are happening separately and have a view for those uh, all helps when you're looking at this application performance monitoring tool and trying to figure out where these bottlenecks are, what the call stack is when they're happening, all of those fun things. Um, so it's, yeah, Blackfire is great. Um, you know, New Relic is, is pretty great too. It's just, it's a matter of, uh, figuring out what the right pricing is, you know, the right combination of things is because APM tools are kind of expensive sometimes, right? Depending on what you're looking at, they can, they can go up really quickly in, in price. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, Blackfire is built from the same people that are responsible for the Symfony Foundation, I think. So they understand PHP 
uh, really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, this is one of the reasons why we actually opted for it. But, but we're not using Blackfire exclusively, but for this kind of test, it serves us well. Yeah, that's uh, platform.sh. That's who uh, who's behind Blackfire. And they do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they do some they, they have a platform as a service for uh, Python a number of other application languages and Blackfire appears to be adding support next for uh, Ruby. Mm. So th they're going from PHP and Python to PHP, Python, and Ruby. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, and then obviously being able to use something like Flood and design a, a testing script to do a load test. Uh, it's really important to be able to script your test when you're working with WooCommerce because the the bottlenecks don't occur just on a page load right the things the things you need to test are the actions a customer are going to complete so adding an item to the cart viewing the uh, the full product page adding an item to the cart viewing the cart viewing the checkout entering card details in test mode for a real checkout and then actually checking out and if you're not testing that entire workflow, you're missing things. You're missing performance problems, uh, especially if you don't have high performance order storage enabled yet. Yeah, we are still waiting, kind of, to uh, for WordPress to kind of jump out of the, uh, or sorry, for WooCommerce to jump jump out of the WordPress way of doing things and actually, you know, the or, or high performance order storage is an awesome thing that we have been waiting for a while. Uh, it uh, yeah it, it makes the database work work so much nicer uh and i hope yeah in the future that we will also see product tables <laughs> proper product tables yeah product tables would be nice uh the problem that they were having with product tables is that variations are hard yeah i i yeah i know that they have a lot of problems a lot of issues that we yes we just want things to happen but there are so many things uh, that need to be looked at and thought through that, yeah. It, it's it's a big problem, right? It's a, it's a big problem. It's a big problem to solve. And um, yeah, variations are difficult right now. If in the, in the feature plugin for product tables, which kind of hasn't been updated for a while, but the, the last that I saw um, when it was still active, variations were actually slower in in the custom table <laughs> then how are they are today yeah <laughs> it's going to be interesting to find you know to figure out how they solve that eventually you know the nice thing is that <clears throat> what i i've said this before on the show but i you know since we're talking about this it's it's kind of relevant at the moment um the methods for Ab abstracting away how data is stored in WooCommerce have been there since 2017 now, right? And now we're sitting in 2024 and there are still plugin authors who are reaching directly into post meta. You know, so if you're a plugin author and you're listening to this because you love the dulcet tones of mine and Carl's voices, listen to this, stop, stop reaching into post meta. You're making all of our lives difficult more difficult than they need to be. Um, we can't deploy, deploy high performance order storage if you're reaching into post meta. So let's just stop doing that. Those helper methods are there for a reason. Use the methods that are in the CRUD classes for each object type in WooCommerce. And let's just move on from this world where we're stuck in the WordPress way. Yeah, true. And and what what this kind of uh, experimentation also gave us gave us insight to is that WooCommerce in some cases is not using uh for example product lookup tables where they should. Um, and we had a chat with, the nice thing about it is that we have a nice connection to uh WooCommerce uh, developers and WooCommerce uh people that work with WooCommerce and um, there is a channel that we can communicate this stuff and they really uh, listen and know that there are still issues and yeah, definitely will, uh, together we can kind of make it better. We as an agency doing this kind of tests, uh, can give them some insight of what we uh, have seen. So for example, I 
think we have uh, in this set of testing with this site, uh, we figured that when uh, purchases are made, WooCommerce needs to recalculate a lot of things about which products are now still available and which products need to go kind of hide, be hidden from the uh, archive pages. So basically, if you bought the product and it's now out of stock, uh, you shouldn't present it in the archive pages, right? So these kind of queries, when you run them on a site that has five people uh, or six people browsing, is nothing. It's like done in milliseconds. But when you have uh, a, uh, a site that has 300 users uh, doing purchases all the time, has uh, like 100 purchases per minute, uh, then these queries can go up to like 15 seconds. And if they are, uh, if, if PHP waits for them to finish to get the new set of data from the database, then the whole application is in problem, right? So, uh, what we have uh, done is we had a, 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 a contact person from WooCommerce uh, to talk to about this. And, uh, we have uh, created a ticket with them where we show them what we have figured out and yeah. That was that was an example of really nice cooperation with WooCommerce, and I think if we have do the, if we do this more often, uh, we will get things done quicker. Yeah, I find that the WooCommerce team is becoming more and more open to collaboration. It, yeah, right to working with other people, and I think that's uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, Paul and his leadership, uh, but. Also, just the market moving in that direction, right? Uh, we have more people using WooCommerce than ever before. So, yes, and different type of uh, people as well. Uh, it's they, I think that bigger merchants are also looking into WooCommerce uh, more seriously as a yeah possible enterprise solution as well than they were a couple of years ago. Uh, so yeah, we've got more people joining the WooCommerce space than ever before. There's bigger businesses coming in. Uh, it's been really cool to see that growth. Yeah. And there's just like, and I mean, again, there's like not a lot of options. If you're like a large company, um, your options are essentially big commerce and, uh, Magento form well formerly Magento now I think it's Adobe Commerce it's called, um, and so it's definitely there's definitely a lot of opportunity there. I feel there's more opportunity there almost than like I know there's a huge push for enterprise like in all of WordPress, but I feel like on the e-commerce side there's like way more of a vacuum um, uh, of opportunity. Uh, and it comes with its own challenges. Like, like we've been talking, like there's like, okay, how do you do the database? You know, like, do you need like a clustering? Like, how do you deal with all the rights and all that stuff? I mean, this is a problem, like essentially with any sort of e-commerce platform. I think they're all pretty write heavy, but they don't have to be as write heavy as like, WooCommerce is by default, you know, like when you have more access to a schema and things like that, but being open to that and everything I think is like really good. And that's, that's my hope. That's like my, this is my like decade. This is like the decade that I'm like, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing like high, high uh, performance scaling stuff with WordPress. That's what I want to do. And also, kind of, I would say it's different uh, when we talk about high performance scaling. It's different thing uh, between the clients. So uh, one client might consider a big scale project something, and another one um, can have a totally different opinion. So, for example, we have built a successful project that has 1.2 million products in the store. Uh, but that is more kind of a business to business customer. And we uh, needed to focus on different things than kind of serving a lot of products uh, to a lot of people at the same time. So that was a different challenge. So I think what we are doing now is kind of the progression of that journey, or that project that we are doing. Yeah, I find that's like the largest challenge with Wook like when people think of WooCommerce versus just like standard WordPress is like the problem space 
as I like to call it, is so massive, right? Because like you could have a person that has like a store with three things, but when they sell those three things or they go on sale, uh, like they're going to get an insane amount of traffic. Or I think of my friend that does micro brewing, where it's like stock, like making sure that the stock, they don't oversell things, right? That they don't have is important so as well in a high traffic scenario or you have you with like business to business where it's like they have millions of skus uh skus and everything and it's just like that's like such a complex thing because like how it breaks is so different from one scenario to another like in one scenario you're, maybe your plugin works like amazing and then the other scenario it's like oh my god like it's it's like terrible here you know yes we show our shares of examples there as well. <laughs> well, and, and then in addition to just the normal day-to-day operation of a, a large-scale e-commerce operation, we have this, this one weekend every year that makes all of our lives a complete and total nightmare. And that's Black Friday through Cyber Monday, Right. And there are, you know, there are times where you see companies that in volume and gross dollar amount, they beat their whole year in one weekend. And if they're going to beat their whole year in one weekend, how do we do that with no interruptions and no downtime? How do we make sure that they can scale at that point, right? So how do we handle that? I mean, how, how do you handle that in, in the day-to-day operation at, at Maximer? Uh, well, yeah, um... When we talk about Black Friday, we have kind of a two-month preparation period where we start contacting our clients and try to kind of figure out with them, to, together with them, how are they going to do their campaigns. I think that's very important uh, because usually what they do is create some landing pages that will show you the products that are uh, on sale. And if we can uh, get that up front and basically... Um, see how can we optimize that part of the site. You don't necessarily need to optimize the whole site for the uh, Black Friday sale. If you can uh, optimize that part that the customers will actually land on, that's a huge deal, if you ask me. So uh, what we are doing is creating kind of a communication channel before Black Friday and uh, figuring out how are they going to do their campaigns uh, so we can focus on that part. Uh, But there are always, as you say, there are always clients that don't take this seriously enough and they uh, decide to create some last minute changes to everything. And there is no good, for, at least from my side, there is no good answer on how to prevent this 100%. Uh, but yeah, I think communication with a client and early preparation uh, is a very, very important. Uh, yeah, but for example, we had this Black Friday, we had a customer that put about 3,000 products on their uh, campaign page. (laughs) And that created uh, 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 the problem for the whole site. Uh, And also what we do is implement some monitoring so we can easily figure out where the server is uh, reaching their uh, resource limits. So, uh, for example, if a server goes beyond 70% of CPU usage or memory usage, we are notified immediately and we can figure out uh, what is wrong before the site crashes? Sometimes that window is very small, though. Like it's like it's a warning, and then like two minutes later, it's like dead. Like I've managed too many servers to like. There's no good warning. I mean, it's better to have a warning than no warning. But it's like sometimes there's just no stopping it. Like if it's if it's happening, it's happening, and you just got like. It's like the tsunami, right? Like it's a tsunami warning and then you're like, okay, I got to run up. I got to run up. But like, you, know, you might not make it, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's happening. So. It's true. But we in the company also have uh, different departments, not just, uh, which also helps. We have uh, a growth department uh, within the same uh, company and we have uh, something we call eco-managers, which are uh, people the clients can hire and help them run their, not just that we build the websites, but run their websites, uh, give suggestions on how uh, how these things should be handled. So uh, we have eco-managers talking to clients and see if a client has an idea, maybe there is a better way of uh, serving the customers the products you actually want them to buy during Black Friday. So that helps as well. 
I mean, store owners are uh, an interesting bunch of people, right? <laughs> it's it's different. Working with e-commerce store owners is a different space than than working with just business owners who need marketing sites. It's it's more of a challenge, and a lot of these store owners, just based on the nature of the industry, they are really self motivated people, and they want to try everything. And they'll hear on the you know, on Twitter or on or X or whatever we're calling it now, um, or they'll hear through one of their mastermind groups or something about some new tool that their friends are using, and they want to implement it right away because it helped their friend grow by ten times, right? Well, yeah, but your friend also had a, a strategy for how they deployed it. So unless you replicate that exactly and your market's the same, you may not have the exact same result, right? But they want to try it. And so we constantly are going to get requests for, you know, we want to try this thing. We want to implement a, uh, for example, an affiliate program because, you know, we, our friend just deployed an affiliate program and, you know, he's doubled his revenue this month with, with affiliates and okay, great. Let's try it. Let's talk about how to do it. Well, we have to use the one he used. Well, okay, he's on Shopify, and he used a a Shopify app. They don't have WooCommerce support, so let's look at alternatives that do the same thing. And so that's that's a big part of the issue, is just trying to rein store owners in to be able to better serve them, because they they do have this self-starter mentality, and they're perfectly happy to jump way down the rabbit hole. And so it, it's it's a lot of fun and, and challenging. Uh, sometimes it's terrifying and, uh, and difficult, but uh, I love the challenge of that. I love, you know, the fact that store owners are so invested in their business that we, you know, they really become partners with us in how we build things. You know, in, in a marketing site, in those traditional uh, marketing sites, a lot of times you go through like content discovery and then they're, oh, we're, we're good. We're good. You, you build the rest and we're good now. And then you hear nothing until it's done, right? And with an e-commerce site build, it's a totally different ballgame. They generally, they want to be involved and have heavily involved from day one and they never stop wanting to be involved because they need to deeply understand how their business operates see because the unique thing about e-commerce compared to every other industry when we're building a website is that what we build controls their entire income stream and that is it blows your mind when you think about it that way right what we build controls their entire income stream. Whereas if, if we're building a marketing site that happens to have a lead funnel in it, if the lead funnel stops working, they still have vans driving around town with their name on the side of it, right? Or they're still out in the community and telling people about their business. But e-commerce needs a larger scale than that. So driving vans around one city doesn't really grow it. We, we have to focus on the fact that we run their entire income funnel and when things go bad when things go wrong because they do we no matter how much we try eventually you know or occasionally things do go wrong when they do how we respond in that position has to be based on the fact that we know that they had a a a water faucet that had money coming out of it and we've turned it off temporarily. And so the money is stopping, and that's how they pay us. So in that position, how we respond really determines how happy the customer ends up being. And I've seen agencies lose customers over not responding well in crisis mode, right? Or hosting. You lose hosting. God. Yeah. For the same reason. Like, I I definitely had that happen with a client this year. Like they're just like, yeah, we're moving out. 
basically. Like, we're giving them so much money, and they're not... I mean, for them, it's a lot of money. I'm sure for, like, the hosting company, it's, like, not a lot. But it's, like, you know, when you're relying it, like you said, it's, like, it's, like, your life, it's your livelihood, right? So it's just, like, it's really critical. Yeah, you don't have a lot of chances to get things right, right? And and you have to make sure that you're consistent about getting things right. Because if you lose that consistency, they start to falter. They start to think, well, maybe I'm in the wrong place. It is a challenge every day. Um, But I love the challenge. I love the challenge because I love knowing that no two days have ever been the same for me since I've been in e-commerce. That's true. Every day is a new challenge. And I love that. I love the challenge. So if you're listening to this and you love the challenge, well, you might need to start focusing on uh, getting into this e-commerce space a little deeper. And, uh, you know, speaking of that, it looks like, uh, you know, Maximer is currently hiring. So if you're looking to get into some of this stuff, uh, that's a, a great place to start, I would think. So, you know, and there are obviously tons of agencies in this space now. It's not what it was in 2017 where there were just a couple of woo experts and <laughs> yeah, we were in the, the very early days of, uh, of the woo commerce experts program. Uh, it's changed a little bit since then. It's changed a lot, I would say. And I think people uh, or agencies also do a lot of cool things on just, not just in WooCommerce, but on top of WooCommerce. Um, so we had a lot of clients that have different, uh, requests. And as you say, they usually find a plugin that does something that maybe does like 80% of the job, but then uh, we need to jump in and uh, add the other 20%. Or uh, we also kind of together with the client, we define what they're trying to solve. And we either use a pre-made solution or totally create a custom solution. So there are a lot of custom uh, things we have built using WooCommerce because it gives us a lot of uh, default uh, things like user management and uh, order creation and stuff like that. But we have built a lot of interesting uh, projects that don't work in a regular WooCommerce uh, sense. Uh, I yeah, last year we actually uh, was we were awarded uh, an innovation award in the Wustash, uh ceremony. So we got an innovation uh, award for a project we have done for an Australian startup that is um, subscription based uh, pharmacy. Uh, we. And we have built a WooCommerce site that doesn't have any product pages, any archive pages. Uh, basically, all purchases are done through uh, finding the correct medication uh, through a form uh, that talks through the API uh, to WooCommerce and a couple of other solutions uh, to kind of give you the right medication. Uh, and basically, although it's a WooCommerce site, everything is controlled through a single form and a My Account page. Hmm. So I would say that you, you, I think people need to start looking at WooCommerce at not just as a whole solution, but also as a part solution for the problem they're trying to solve, because I think it's awesome for that. Well, those of us here at, uh, at the Do The Woo podcast uh, know nothing about winning sashis. Uh, we were not the advocate of the year. Um, and then uh, we don't have we don't have one of our hosts, uh, Katie Keith, who won twice with Barn Two. Um, yeah, that was that was pretty exciting to uh, to be a part of that uh, that awards ceremony, and you know it's uh, it's pretty great. I I think that Brian does a remarkable job with Woosesh. Um, you yeah, know, it's all it's always fun, um, and we get to do the. Uh, the daily wrap up says do the woo most of the time. And those have been a good time. I've, I've really enjoyed being part of those and I'm, I'm proud of the work that Brian's done. So yeah, Carl and I talked about this, I think in Asia that woo deserves a uh, more kind of this smaller and bigger conferences where people that do a lot of stuff with WooCommerce actually meet and exchange experiences. It's like they need to have WooCom fact. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. 
I'd love to see an event like it back. Um, you know, but the the interesting thing about the WooCommerce market is you have you have two separate audiences to serve, right? And technically, technically there are three. There are three audiences because there's the store owner audience, and that's where Woo makes their money, right? So they may want to run a store owner focused event next. Who knows? Um, and then you have the builder community, which we serve here at do at do the woo and the developer community, which is kind of different from the builder community, right? And the, uh, the developer community that, uh, we talk to on these dev chats every, every month, um, has a unique set of challenges. So if they were to do one event now to cover everything, they'd have to have events. They'd have to have sessions for store owners. They'd have to have sessions for builders and they'd have to have sessions for um, developers. And that's hard. It's hard to run an event that has that much content. So I don't know what the the solution is going to be long term, but uh, I would love to see something come back. So awesome. Well, uh, you know, normally at the end of the episode, we just ask if uh, if you have any closing thoughts you want to leave the audience with. Um, so I'll let you take that away. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would then repeat myself of what I said last. I think WooCommerce, uh, should be perceived as, uh, a, a really, really cool platform you can extend in your own way. Uh, don't just look, uh, to the kind of, uh, regular uses of WooCommerce and plugins that are already made. There's so many things you can do with it, uh, especially now that the API, uh, is much, much better for WooCommerce than what we saw a couple of years ago. Uh, I think just the, the kind of projects you can do on top of WooCommerce are going to be much more interesting in the future. Awesome. Well, it's been great uh, having a conversation with you today. I love it. Where can we find you? Yeah, where can we find you on the interweb? <laughs> <laughs> on the interweb? Well, I'm not big on social media. <laughs> Uh, I don't have a Facebook account. Uh, yeah, so y- you can definitely find me in all WordPress, major WordPress conferences. Uh, we as a company support a lot of them, and we also as individuals tend to visit a lot. So if you are going to be in Asia or work in Europe, uh, you definitely can find some of us. I can attest to that. They're around. I'm never too far. At least at some points during the the conference, we're never too far from each other. All right. Well, it's good chatting with all of you. Yeah, it was excellent. Thank you, guys. I'd like to thank Ninad for sharing his experiences and insights with us on Woo Dev Chat. And if you're interested in being on the show or have a topic you would like to hear discussed, ping us over on do the woo.io. Or if you're going to WordCamp Asia, visit us at our booth in March. Also, I'd like to thank Jetpack and Avalara for their support in helping Zach and Carl continue these developer conversations each month. So keep the code coming, and until the next time, don't stop doing the woo.